to start off today, I just want to share a little bit about my life and why I'm doing what I'm doing and how God has has been working in my life. And, you know, sometimes when I first meet somebody or they've heard, you know, about a little bit about my testimony, think, oh, you're the girl that works in Africa or whatever, and that's great, but there's so much more of a history in my life of God starting to work in me um, than just kind of what people see and hear. <clears throat> and one thing you know, like, through my youth and as a kid and stuff, I used to get so, like, disillusioned by, was you'd see people come in, and they'd share, like, this massive revelation, and they'd share all these great glory stories about what God was doing, but you seemed so, like, I seemed so distant, so far away from them, and it was like, how would I ever get there? Like, how would I ever get to be in that place to do those kinds of miracles or to do those kinds of things? I'm just a simple person, and so... I really want to be able just to be real about my walk and, and how God has met me um, because so often people don't share that. They just share the glory stories and they don't tell you about how they got there and the work that God's done to bring them there. And I know that all of us are in a journey and God is, is you know, different stages of the journey and God is bringing us um, daily to new levels and to new insights. So um, just a bit about myself is I was born... Um, into a Christian family, and, you know, my parents were great, loved the Lord. Um, as in my early years, you know, I don't ever remember, actually, I can never remember a day when I didn't love the Lord as a child. Um, I had encounters with the Lord when I was little. Um, when I was two years old, I saw Jesus walk into my room. And it's actually kind of a funny story because I was very afraid of um, roosters that my neighbors had. Because one time they, you know, pecked my little finger. And so, traumatized by the event, um, every night I would lay in bed and cry. And, um, you know, my parents decided, okay, that they couldn't keep coming in every single night and, you know, calming me. That I had to just learn to just get over it. So, um, they decided just to leave me one night. And I was crying and crying and crying and crying. And I was so scared. And I have vague memories of this. But... I remember exactly how my little room looked, all my little toys, my little bed, and, and um, as I was just crying out in terror, um, Jesus walked into my bedroom, and he just sat right on my bed, and just in a very simple way, he just looked at me, and he smiled, and he said, you don't have to cry. I'll watch your window all night, because I used to think the roosters were going to jump through my window and peck me when I fell asleep. That's why I was so scared. So um, that was my first encounter with Jesus, um, him just comforting me and being a father and saying, it's okay, you don't have to cry, I'll watch your window. You know, in a very simple language and in a way, you know, he could have said, hey, roosters aren't going to come through your window, you know, but he said, he just spoke a language that I understood and he gave me peace. And so um, from that time, I just love the Lord. When I was little, um, it's kind of a family joke, but I used to take like my, my mom's little, I don't know, little table and I used to stand there with um, a little spoon, you know, or whatever as my microphone. And I'd line up all my dolls and my, my stuffed animals on the couch. And I would preach to them, you know, and um, try to read from the Bible and make it up because I couldn't even read. You know, I was really little. Um, so ever since I was young, I had this real desire to serve the Lord. Um, but when I was seven, my parents got divorced. And that was a very difficult time for me because totally didn't see it coming. We had, like a great family. Um, my parents were Christians. I mean, it was just a shock, a huge shock for me, and it was very devastating. And um, I remember so clearly the day that my dad actually left. Um, I was laying in my bed in my room, and I was just sobbing, and my heart was so broken. I just remember all these feelings of just being afraid and sad and thinking, I, who's going to be my dad and how's this going to work? And I'm so afraid and I knew we didn't have money. And I mean, it was just on and on and on that this whole thing was happening. We were going to have to leave our home. And um, as I was just crying out, I have such a clear memory in my little seven-year-old mind of the Lord just coming into my room. You know, not I didn't see him, but I just felt his presence so strong. And he just spoke to me and he said, you know, very sim almost very similar to what he said to me when I was two, you know. He just said, it's okay, I'll be your daddy. And when he spoke those words, it was so simple, but it was something that went so deep inside of me. And I knew at that point that, okay, he'll be my daddy. 
And it was just a settled issue in my heart. And my mom, um, just amazing woman of faith. And so she raised us in a way that was, he is your father, literally. And everything we needed, whatever it was, well, let's go ask your father because a good father provides for his children. And so I have so many memories of, of great memories, but in my childhood of, um, you know, there'd be times where there'd just be absolutely nothing left in our cupboards, nothing. And my mom, you know, was never had this poverty mentality or anything, and so we were never even allowed to say that we were poor, you know, and her, we're rich in the kingdom, and blah, 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 you know, God will provide, and it's like, okay, mom, but there's no food left, you know, and so we'd be down to the very last thing, and um, I just remember just, we'd just pray, we'd just cry out to the Lord, you know, and we'd just say, God, you're our dad, and a dad feeds his kids, and daddy, we need food, amen, simple, you know, and um, we'd go off to school or wherever we were going, and I mean, there are so many countless times that this happened. And we'd come home from school or wherever, church, wherever we were, and exactly that time there would be, I mean, just bags and bags and bags of groceries left on our doorstep. No note. We never had a clue. Nobody ever knew what was going on with us. And I mean, it was so extravagant, okay? I mean, like if you can put yourself in the head of an 8 or 9 or 10-year-old, um, it wasn't just like, you know crisis cooking kind of food, okay? It was like serious food. And I mean, my brother and I, like I used to love chunky peanut butter and my brother was all about creamy pe peanut butter. And every time my mom would go to the store, she'd have to pick one or the other, you know? I mean, we'd have a huge Costco size, you know, of each. And it would be like all the cereals your mom would never buy you, you know, like Lucky Charms. I mean, all the good stuff, you know, like packed in these bags and we'd just be like, ah, you know, God loves us. And every single time, you know, we never, ever missed a meal. Like God always provided. And um, my mom would just believe in such a way. And it was such an example for me. But she, um, there was one time where my brother had totally ruined his only pair of shoes. And so we needed new shoes. And it was a Saturday, and she took us down to Don's Shoe Store, which is like the big, sh you know, shoe store in our little town. And, I mean, this is such faith. She had absolutely no money whatsoever. And she went in, and she told my brother, okay, I want you to go in and pick out your favorite pair of shoes. So my brother goes in, and he tries on, you know, we spend all this time, he's trying on shoes. He picks his favorite pair of shoes, and uh, she says, okay. She asks Don can you ring this up and tell us how much this will be? And he tells her the price, and I don't remember exactly the price, but I'm going to make one up. So it was like thirty-eight nineteen, okay, the, the total. And, uh, and so she's like, okay, thank you, we'll be back. And I'm just going like, I can't believe, you know, my mom did this. And we go home, and she says, let's just pray. So we pray, Dad, Jason needs shoes. Good dads buy shoes for their kids. We need some shoes. That was it. The next day, um, we were walking into church, and this lady came running up to my mom, and she was like, I'm so sorry, you know, please don't be offended by this, please, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but, g I mean, God has just been screaming to me, I cannot escape this. I woke up this morning with this number rolling in my head, I have to write you a check right now for 3819, and we're just like, you know, so touched by God. And it's like, we left church and went and bought shoes. And so that was, in my early years, um, a lot of the foundation of my being able to trust the Lord. Um, but as I got into, you know, my early teens, <clears throat> I call this my dark era because um, that's where a lot of my pain and anger and brokenness started really manifesting and just coming to the surface. And I'd shoved it down for a, wa you know, a long time, and then it was like I was done shoving. And uh, so those are some really hard years that I walked through, and I'm not going to go into a lot of it, but there was a lot of things that happened in those early teen years that were very painful, and um, you know, I was just really hurting and broken and desperately wanted to serve the Lord, but God felt a million miles away. And I would get all these prophetic words, you know, God's plan for my life, but I was a mess. I was a total mess. I was making terrible choices, um, you know, at the same time crying out to God, oh, I want to serve you, but at the same time, like, totally living for myself in my flesh, um, 
just being constantly torn on this fence of, of hot and cold. And so that lasted for a couple years. And um, in that time, I'm so grateful for the mercy of God over my life, you know, for the, th- the things that he protected me from. But when I was 16 years old, um, I was sitting in Taco Bell, actually, with some friends, and God just began to speak to me in the most profound way, and it was very simple. I mean, I'm sitting in Taco Bell, you know, but I just began to have a revelation of truth, and God began to speak to me, and he said, make a decision. I've had grace for you on your life, but the grace is going to come to an end, like, for this. You're either for me or you're against me. Like, it's no more middle ground, you know? And he made a statement that absolutely rocked me. He said, what's it going to be? Are you going to serve me or are you going to serve yourself? And, you know, as a kid, like, I didn't know any other teenagers at that time who were really passionately going after God. There wasn't a big movement of youth and stuff at all in our area. I mean, it was totally, the kids I knew in church were (laughs) totally, they loved God, but they were really a huge mess. And so, I was like, whoa, because I mean, I'd always heard, you know, serve God or serve the devil, you know, as a kid. But it was like, that's different. Serve God or serve myself. Can't we do both? You know, and it was like, no. So um, so I had to make a decision. What was it going to be? Was I going to live for myself or was I going to live for the Lord fully? And I understood, even though I didn't have a, a model, I understood what that would cost me. And so I remember going home and just crying out to the Lord and just really mourning it was like a death. I mean, it was a death. And saying, okay, Lord, I'm going to lay down my life and fully serve you. And um, so that was at 16. And I, when I made that, that great exchange of wills, you know, between my will and his will, um, I thought, great. I've always wanted to serve the Lord. Now I'm, like, fully surrendered, so here it goes. You know, it's going to be exciting. It wasn't exciting at all. It was terrible. Like, the next years was just one death after another in my life. And it was just like, God, I don't understand. You've, you know, you've given me these things to believe for and all these prophetic words, but it was just like, I mean, it was so difficult. It started with, um, you know, at 16, I had friends that were bad influences. So the Lord said, well, are you willing to lay, you know, your friends down? I'm like, okay, I'll go through my last two years of school with no friends. Fine, you know, and so that was hard. Walk through that, lay my friends down. Um, and then the Lord, you know, I, one thing I'd always wanted to do in school was um, I wanted to go to UCLA. That was my dream school. I had worked really, really hard, and I got this absolutely amazing scholarship to go. And so I'm like, praise the Lord. It's an answer to prayer. Scholarship, full ride, UCLA, here I go. And uh, the Lord spoke to me the night before I sent in my confirmation of going and said, I'll bless you if you go, but it's not my highest for you. Will you lay it down? And it was like the biggest stab in my heart. I mean, I had just worked my backside off for four years in school to get this scholarship. And it was like, okay, Lord, this doesn't make sense. My family does not like this idea, but I'll lay this down. And so I chose not to go, and I went to another university instead and did what the Lord asked me to do. And it was so difficult for me. All those years um, in college was very difficult. A real season of the Lord purifying me, of him healing me, working on me. It was slugging it out. It was no fun. Like, I had all this vision, and I was having dreams and and prophetic encounters with the Lord, but, I mean, it was like zero outlet, you know, few friends, um, working two jobs, taking twice as many units as I was supposed to. I mean, it was just terrible, slugging it out day after day. And the Lord kept saying, you know, will you continue to believe me? Will you continue to love me? And I'm like, this is laying it down, huh? Like, I thought it was going to be some great invitation to, like, travel the world or, you know, do things for you. And it was like, this is no fun. You know, this is painful. And um, when I was 19, I got into a, a very serious relationship and wanted to get married at that time. And uh, this was another one of the huge things that the Lord really used in my life to, to shatter my will. <laughs> and um, at that point, you know, the Lord, you know, I, was, I knew that this was very clo- getting very close to marriage, and I, I asked the Lord, I said, you know, God, I really need to hear from you on this. And the Lord spoke to me, and he, same thing, and he gave me a choice. And he said, you know what? 
if you want to marry this person, I'll bless it. It'll be my, you know, my permissive will, but it is not my highest will for you. It is not my highest will for you. And um, then again, he said, will you lay this down for love? Will you lay this down? And that was such a difficult choice for me because it felt like it was the last thing that I desperately wanted to hold on to in my life and God was taking it away and it just didn't seem like his character. But then I began to understand because every time I had laid something down, I had had such a massive um, increase of his presence in my life and so I knew it was worth it. And I laid that down and um, went through a, a difficult season of just grieving and, and letting God heal me and walk me through that. Um, but I just continued to say yes. And so through all those years, you know, I, God took this broken, hurting little girl and began to heal me and, and bring me closer into his heart. And so at that point, by the time I graduated from college, I, I figured I felt pretty dead like to, my, to myself and was feeling very alive in my spirit. Um, but it felt like I'd really surrendered and, and kind of jokingly said, you know, God, I don't think there's anything else to die to. Like, you've taken it all away, so I'm good to go. And uh, then the Lord said, actually, I want you to move to Canada. And um, that was another death. <laughs> Being a California girl, moving out to the middle of freezing Canada didn't sound like, you know, my favorite idea. So um, I obeyed because I knew at this point, you just like, you just go along for the ride. You know, he always knows more. So move out to Canada and... Um, while I was there, I'd left everything. I'd left my job, my apartment, my car, everything, and moved to Canada. Going, what am I doing here? What is this about? You know. And um, and the Lord spoke to me when I was there, and He said, "Okay, um, this man, Ralph Bromley, who is who I was staying with, and he's um, an am- amazing, amazing man, one of my, you know, greatest mentors and a father to me." And um, the Lord spoke to me and said, "He's he's going to offer you something." And whatever he offers you, you accept. And I mean, this wasn't like an audible voice of God. This was like a knowing in my heart. And so Ralph comes to me one day and he says, I think you're supposed to go to Africa. Go for six months by yourself. And it's like, you've got to be kidding me. So, all right, Lord. So I, I agree. And um, I get out into to Africa. And at this point... Um, I feel like I've just been on this huge journey of downward mobility. And it's just like, I said yes to the Lord, and he began to take me what felt like lower and lower and lower and lower. And it was a process of dying to my my flesh and dying to myself. And I'm sure many of you, your flesh isn't as strong-willed as mine, but it was a real process to get my flesh to die. Um, But every time the Lord would, would walk me through another death, there was, there was life that came to me in such a, a really powerful way. So my adventures in Africa began at that point. And actually the Lord spoke to me um, very clearly, and it was June 5th, 2001. It was before I even knew, I, before I'd even gone to Canada. So I was, I just graduated from college. I was living in my apartment in, in California, and um, the Lord spoke to me. And I have this all in my journal, and it's so precious, but he began to say, I want to send you on a great mission and it's going to cost you absolutely everything. It's going to be very difficult. It's going to be very lonely. It's going to be the loneliest time you'll ever walk through. It'll be painful. It'll be hard. The only thing familiar to you will be my presence. Um, And he said, I want you to betroth yourself to me. Betroth yourself to me the way that you would marry a natural husband. I want you to give me all of your time, your will, your emotions. And that was not the news I was looking for at that point in my life. I had just given everything up. I actually, I think at that point, I was 21. I had just graduated from college. And I, I think that day I had been crying out to the Lord, just feeling frustrated and wanting to get married and all this stuff. And the Lord says, will you betroth yourself to me? I was like, okay, Lord. Okay. I don't know what, I had no clue what he was talking about. I'm going to send you on a mission and it's going to be really hard and lonely. But if you accept it, and these are the words he said, if you accept this mission, this is about gaining authority. He said, this is about spiritual promotion. I had no idea what that meant. And then he spoke to me and he says, will you commit to doing this for one year? 
And I mean, that just seems like an eternity, a year of hell. Great. You know, I mean, didn't I just get out of that season? You know, and it was just like, oh Lord. And so I was like, okay. And then he said, will you commit for two years? And I bawled and bawled and bawled because like, how do you say no to the Lord? But it was just like, oh, will I ever live, you know, and just mourned and just, oh, it was so heart wrenching. And I was like, okay, Lord, I'll commit for two years. And then he said, will you commit for three years? And um, that was so difficult. I thought it was just like the knife couldn't go any deeper in my heart. Fine. <laughs> so I decided, all right, you know, here I go. Three years of whatever you want to do, Lord. I trust you. Okay, this is about spiritual promotion. This is about authority, gaining authority. I'm willing. Do with me as you will. I won't say no to you. And because when I was 16, I had, made, I had made a vow before the Lord that I would never say no to him that whatever he asked of me, I would not deny him, that I was truly exchanging my will for his. And so um, so then, like, instantly after that, things started changing. Um, lots of things started happening, but I ended, up, I ended up now in Africa. Okay, I had no idea that was coming. And um, as I get out to Africa, I actually go to northern Kenya, which is um, the Turkana Desert, and it's a tribe called the Turkana that is incredibly primitive. Um, I'm talking straight up out of National Geographic. Um, hardly dressed, you know, rings up to here, little mohawk things, um, straight up. Okay, this is not modern Africa at all. And the place I go is completely out of control. So it's like just the, the con physical conditions are completely difficult. I mean, it's 130 plus every single day. There's not a tree as far as you can see. It's sand as far as you can see. Maybe a little roaming goat or camel or something, but it's sand, you know? I mean, absolutely no life. Everything is brown, everything. Um, there's no water. People are dying. People would literally throw their bodies in front of our vehicle, children, and it was either hit them or stop. And when you stop, they're just begging you to put one drop of water on their tongue. That's how desperate for water they are. Their hands would just be bloody from digging for hours and days in the sand, searching for water before they would die. It was absolutely horrific. I mean, massive famine. It hadn't rained in forever. I mean, it was just terrible conditions, incredible drought. Um, you know, the animals are all skinny and withering away. Um, the only reason the people were alive was because World Vision was there every single day dishing out food to everybody. That's how they were surviving. Not only that, um, they don't even really like women in this tribe, okay? Let alone single young women who come from America, you know, and it's just like, great, here I am, you know? And so I get out there by myself. They're like, who are you? And it's incredibly violent, um, there's tribal wars and whatnot happening. So daily people are being murdered, especially if you're white, you're a huge target, um, which added, of course, to my security. So even to travel in, I had to be escorted by AK-47 arms, armed guards just to get in. And every time you got on the road, you had to have armed guards who literally hanging out the window, like ready at any second to shoot because you get shot at. And so I'm going, God, I hope you know what you're doing, you know? get out there. And the whole point, actually, the, the reason why Ralph had sent me out there was, was to develop this um, women's organization with Hope for the Nations, which is the ministry he works with. And I was going to be working with women and children. Um, but the day I get to Africa, I get a notice saying from this other organization who was sending us money to do this, the, a grant, that there's this huge problem. We're not getting the grant. There's no money. Can't have this program. And we're like, Fabulous. I just got myself to the middle of Africa for six months and I can't do what I came to do. So what the heck am I doing here? And it was just like, okay, Lord, I mean, we're talking, okay, no internet, no communicating with your family, no phones, nothing out in the middle of nowhere going. I mean, if one of these spiders even looks at me, I could die, you know, and all by myself and there's nobody to help me. I mean, there's just, it's, huge, huge beasts that crawl in that land. I don't even know spiders and scorpions. And I was just like, God. And, um, you know, when I really thought things just couldn't get worse, um, 
I find out that this whole tribe I'm working with, the Turkana tribe, is in blood covenants with Satan. And so I'm thinking, you know, good times, good times. So um, not only are they in blood covenants with Satan, but they've been in blood covenants with Satan since like the conception of their tribe, like thousands of years. And I'm going, you've got to be kidding, you know? And there are so many curses and so many strongholds in this place that literally, um, like the people live under this massive oppression and the drought and the famine, that's all part of the curse. And so I start kind of digging into this thing, you know, and coming from a Hispanic culture, I mean, I'm, I, I know a lot about superstition, okay? And I know that a lot of things are superstitious. And so I'm kind of finding out, like, how much of this is superstition? How much of this is legit? And it was all legit. <laughs> so I was like, fabulous. So basically what's happening is if these people don't pay homage to these demons, if they don't do these blood sacrifices continually, then them and their entire families and their livestock will bleed instantly, bleed profusely through the nose until they all die. Or um, if they don't do the right sacrifices or whatever, their huts and whatever, their whole family, it will all instantly, spontaneously combust and people die. This is very serious. People live in terrible fear, terrible, terrible fear, and they walk so carefully to appease these demons. If not, they suffer. And so then, kind of adding another twist, find out the Christians, because there are some believers there, are also under these same curses. And they came to me, and they were like, what's the deal? We love Jesus. I mean, this is a pastor. You know, my friends James and Ann, they're pastors up there. They're a young couple, really awesome. They said, what's the deal? We love God. And, you know, we had a curse put on us because we won't do these ceremonies that all of our children will die at birth. And we thought, oh, we're, we're, we're Christians. It can't touch us. Well, sure enough, every time they get pregnant and have a baby, within 24 hours, the baby dies. And they're ripped off. Like, what's the deal? And I, I have no answers for them. No answers. I don't know. I thought being a Christian was all it took. You know, I don't know. And I find, found myself in a situation where I felt so small. And everything that I was facing seemed so huge. And I mean, I walked into this going, what can I even do about this? Like, who the heck am I? I am nobody. Like, God, you picked the wrong person for this job because I don't know how to break thousand-year blood covenants. I can barely get myself free. Like, I don't know, you know, I don't know anything about this. I am, I mean, I just, one night, I just so lost it in my little hut. I mean, I was crying out to God, and I'm like, I'm so inadequate, and you should have sent somebody else, and blah, blah, blah. I'm just, like, crying and crying out. I had such compassion for these people. But, I mean, it seems so huge. What in the world can one dumb little person, is how I felt, do about poverty, about injustice, about, I mean, you name it, violence. Like, what can I do? Nothing. And I just felt so hugely inadequate. I could just feel the pleasure of the Lord. And he just spoke to me in a really sweet way. And he said, you know what? You are totally, completely inadequate. And I could just like, it was like he was just laughing, you know? I thought, you think this is funny, Lord, you know? And, and he said, you're totally inadequate. And he said, and don't ever forget it because that's your greatest strength. Don't ever forget it. And I was like, okay. And he said, are you willing to believe me for a strategy? Do you believe that I still use David's to take down Goliath's? And of course, you know, our little Sunday school answers, well, yes, Lord, I believe. But I mean, it was like in my face. I'm like, okay, Lord, I believe, but this is different, you know? And God was like, no, this is not different. And so hope came into my heart. Maybe actually God could really use little nobodies to do something about this. And so my first response was in human wisdom. Well, we could maybe bring in the UN and do this. And, you know, I'm like thinking all these, trying to think of plans how to help these people. And God was just kind of like, actually, it was really funny because Ralph, who's such a great mentor of mine, I email him. You know, I get to a place where I can actually, you know, communicate with the outside world. And I email him all these ideas I have. And he's just like, yeah, go back to God. You know? <laughs> now go get God's strategy. That's a great idea. Now go get God's strategy. <laughs> and, um, and so um, we get on our face before the Lord. And it's just a couple people just like us. It's me and some, some Turkana people who are, are you know young adults. We just get on our face before the Lord. And we're like, God, 
what is the strategy for breaking this covenant? How do we, how do these people get free? And God began to give us a strategy as we began to fast and pray. And the idea that he gave us was we were to call all the leaders together of the whole region because it was the, the founding leaders who had put the tribe into covenant. So we thought, well, let's call all the leaders, you know, of this generation together. And that's a start. Like, we'll have them break it, you know. So that was step one. So we decide, okay, we don't know what we're going to do when we get them here, but let's call them all together. So we, like, send little runners, you know, like little men to go running village to village all throughout, you know, for days until they tell everybody, if you're a pastor, if you're an intercessor, if you're a tribal leader, government leader, you must be at this gathering. And so people just came. I mean, they walked for days. People come, leaders, all leaders. We have 1,500 leaders that come. And um, a month before this, okay, this was, the conference was in December. About a month and a half before this, um, the Lord speaks to me that there's this man that's supposed to come. And his name is Arthur Burke, and some of you might have heard of him. He's um, a minister. He does a lot with um, communities and breaking strongholds over areas. And I had met him in Argentina maybe three years prior. And I just have the sense that he's supposed to come. And I'm thinking, okay, first of all, this is totally impossible. Like, this guy is very well known, very well respected. Like, he travels all over the place ministering. Um, I'm sure he's booked for the next year, first of all. Second of all, what am I going to, I'm going to just send him a little email and be like, hi, you don't know who I am, but um, do you want to come in a month, you know, I know you're busy, but in a month to Africa during Christmas, yeah, I know, um, at your own expense because I can't pay your way and I can't even give you an honorarium, you know, like we could give you a little goat to eat or something, but that's all we got going for you, you know, will you come out and help us? And we just were like praying, like, God, we need, you know, send the troops, we need reinforcement here. And so um, I get this email back and he's like, I've never done this what the heck, you know, God said I'm supposed to come, here I come. Cancels, his, so he's supposed to be traveling in Europe that month, cancels everything and comes at his own expense, everything, and comes out. And, um, and so he led a lot of the conference, the teaching and the training on breaking curses and covenants. And, um, and the strategy that God, God gave us was very simple. And this is what I love about the Lord is you know, it's so great to have all this great revelation and teaching and stuff, but you know what? When it comes down to kingdom, God is very easy. God is very simple, and that's never going to change. The kingdom and God's solutions, God's, God's ways of doing things are always for the simple to understand and apply. And so the strategy he gave us was very simple. He said, it's really easy. The only way that these people can get out of this blood covenants with Satan is they have to enter into a stronger blood covenants. And so we thought, okay. So we gather everybody together, and we pray. They break all the, um, you know, the curses, whatever. And, I mean, these people are terrified because God better be in this or we're all, you know, dead, basically. This is very serious. And um, during this time, it just so happened to be the one week of the whole year where um, – the, this one week, the peak of the drought, the peak of the summer in December, December's their hot month, the peak of, of the drought in December, um, everybody from all over the world, if you're a part of this tribe, you must return to this desert and offer your sacrifices. It's called the appeasement of the dead ceremony. And if you don't do this, you will suffer. So it's the high point this week of all the demonic power in this place. And they're just slaughtering thousands of animals, doing tons of witchcraft. It's totally demonic, reinforcing for the new year their covenant with Satan. At the same time, just so happened, we didn't even plan it. The only week we could do it happened to be this week. So, I mean, it was such intense warfare. And, um, and so we gather everybody together. We do everything the Lord tells us to do. And symbolically, you know, for the tribe to enter into blood covenants with Jesus Christ is what we did. Is they, they, to break the covenant, they entered into blood covenants with Christ. So symbolically, we took communion, we poured. We, I mean, we had no theological grid for this, okay? I had no grid for this. I'm like, I didn't even know land could be in covenants with whatever. So, but if Satan had covenants with this land, like, we're taking it back. That is not okay, you know? And so we're pouring the communion on the land, and we're just like, we're calling the land into covenants with Jesus, and um, 
it was so led by the Holy Spirit and very simple. But our hearts were so just to obey, listen and obey. And it was, I mean, literally you had to, to walk in a way. If you don't listen and obey very carefully, it could cost you your life and the lives of many people. And so I had such fear of God. Um, but after we did everything the Lord told us to do, we were like, okay, God, we did everything you said, but we need, like a, we need to hear from you. Like, we need to know you're in this. So we said, we, want, we need two signs. First, will you give us a sign that you're pleased? Like, sign your name to this covenant. Like, let us know you're into this, you know? And number two, will you give us a sign that you've truly brought down the demonic stronghold over this land? And so um, as we waited on the Lord, he gave us our two signs. And so during this conference, what happened was um, the heavens, I mean, literally, like you could see it with your eyes just began to open and they began to pour down rain. Now this is a land where it doesn't rain, okay? People are dying of, of thirst. It begins to pour rain. I mean, you can see people on their face, worshiping, dancing. I mean, we didn't even have to tell them God was pleased, okay? They knew God was pleased. And it, as it poured down rain, it was like, oh my goodness, this is like a Bible story. Wow, God's pleased. You know, we like signed his name to the covenant. We were so pumped. And we're like, yeah, now we need our second sign, you know. And sure enough, we got our, we got our other sign. Um, and what happened was this huge bolt of lightning came out of heaven and struck this mountain, which is called Goat Mountain. And Goat Mountain is the high point of all demonic power in that whole land. It's where all the witch doctors and diviners, and I'm not talking little, you know, I'm talking high, high, high priest, witch doctors, diviners, okay, with very legitimate, legitimate demonic power, with tons of followers. People come from all over the world to see these guys, and they're up there offering their sacrifices. God strikes the mountain with a bolt of lightning. Instantaneously, their power is dried up. They're freaked out in such terrible fear. They're running down the mountain thinking that they're going to be killed. And we're like, yeah, you know, God brought down the demonic stronghold. I mean, we had some of the, some of the youth from the conference take off running because you could see them coming down the mountain, running um, out. We heard these stories later. I didn't even know that this happened. And, um, and met these guys at the bottom of the mountain and ended up leading them to the Lord. And the, like one of this one witch doctor, um, he went through three months nonstop deliverance, manifesting for three months until every demon was out of him. And after those three months, he's so filled with the Spirit. Now this guy's actually working with us, one of our head intercessors, um, radically saved and converted. Um, and it's been very interesting because he's really helped bring a lot of insight to the inter intercessors about what happens on the other side. And so he's really released a lot of the strategies of the enemy. And um, it's been very powerful. But we got our signs and we were like, this is awesome. You know, God is in this. This is like legitimate power. This is real but it, it was like something inside of me wasn't satisfied yet. It was like, this is good, but you know what? I want to see the fruit of this. I want to see people change. It's not just about signs and wonders. If signs and wonders is the end, that's, that's not enough for me. And so um, it just so happened that my friends, um, James and Anne, that I was telling you about, the young couple, um, they happened to be pregnant again at the conference. Now, you know, every child they were having was dying um, so they were like, we really hope this works, you know, and it was the grace of God because she was three weeks overdue from delivering and that she hadn't delivered yet. But the last day of the conference, um, she delivered a perfectly healthy baby girl and everybody's kind of waiting to see like, is it really broken? You know, is this going to work? And sure enough, the baby was totally fine. And her daddy held her up, you know, in his little, in his hand in front of everybody and, and said, um, this is our child. Her name is Peace. She'll have no middle name, no last name. Her name is Peace. And from this day forward, every time you see this child, she will be a prophetic reminder to you that on this day, we came into peace with the living God. Powerful. Powerful. And um, we were so undone, you know, and we're like, God, you're so good. And I actually have pictures of her all over my wall because she's so cute. Um, but we got to go back and, and be a part of dedicating her to the Lord eight months later, and she's perfectly healthy now at two and a half or however old she is and um, doing great. So that was the beginning of transformation for that land because when that broke, I mean, what can I do about poverty, any of that? Nothing. What can God do? God's got strategies because he's God. <laughs> so 
you know, we didn't know that a lot of this stuff was being rooted by this demonic, demonic uh, force that was, that was the covenants. And when that broke, total transformation began to come to this land. They began to cry out to God. And within the next eight months, they received more rainfall up there than anywhere else in the whole nation. And when I went back eight months later, as far as you could see, there was grass where there was once sand. There was life. There was trees going. It was the climate had actually, the temperature had decreased. It was such a a powerful demonstration of transformation. The animals were fat. Actually, World Vision packed up and moved out. We're not even there because people were thriving on their own. There was water. There was food. Um, there, was, there had not been one murder in eight months when I went. I mean, I'm talking people were murdered daily. There had not been one reported murder in eight months. I didn't have to have any armed guards take me in. God was sovereignly moving. And um, that transformed me. Wow. God, the God of the Bible is still the God that's alive and working today, and he still does use little nobodies to do great things. And, um, but you know, in telling that, that story, I have to tell the other piece because it's so, they're so connected. But um, actually the day before the conference started, the Lord spoke to me and he said, I'm so proud of you for believing for this. I am so you know, I can just feel the, the, the pleasure of the Father over me. And he said, but I have to warn you, if you go forward with this, you're in my will, you've done everything I've told you to do, but if you go forward with this, the enemy will try to take your life. So you need to make a decision. Are you going or are you staying? And it was like, you know, there wasn't the little clause on the end, like, oh, but by the way, you know, I'll rescue you, so don't worry. I mean, there was none of that. It was like, what's your decision? And I didn't know if he would. And so I just really got on my face before the Lord, and I just, it was very, it was very easy for me. I don't know. Like, I guess because he had already walked me through such a series of dying to my flesh, and I just said, Lord, if I die, I die. That's not an issue. Like, I'm not going to just let the enemy rob my life, you know? But to lay my life down for an entire people group to get saved and delivered, yeah, that's worth it. Okay, if I die, I die. That's fine. But I'm confident of one thing. Satan can do absolutely nothing to me that you don't permit, because my life is in your hands. And so that was my piece, and I went forward with it. And um, on the first day of the conference, um, within 24 hours of when the Lord spoke that to me, for absolutely no reason, I became incredibly ill. And um, I didn't know what was happening. My body just was instantly shutting down. A very high fever, um, vomiting, passing out, the whole, the whole deal. And there was such a demonic attack against me. I could feel the enemy just mocking me and laughing at me and telling me, you know, ha, 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 you're going to pay with your life. I hope this is worth it to you. And I just kept very simply, like, I wouldn't even deal with the enemy. I would just say, you know what, take it up with the Lord. Take it up with the Lord. This is his decision. Take it up with the Lord. And over the next series of days, um, I just became worse and worse, and um, was at a point where I couldn't, I couldn't move, I was in my bed, I was very, very, very ill, and, um, you know, this poor guy, Arthur, that comes out to do this conference, not only is he, like, eating goat and paying his own expenses, he's, like, caring for me, because, I mean, I couldn't, he had to carry me to the bathroom, I mean, I was so ill, I couldn't even walk, and, um, and it got to a point where I knew that if God didn't show up quickly, I was going to die because I, I was 14 aw hours away from civilization if you had a vehicle, which I had no vehicle and no way to contact anybody. So I'm out in the middle of the desert going, God, you have to do a miracle. And um, <clears throat> so at that point, you know, we were getting worried. I started to sweat this like thick orange toxic liquid. And so we knew that all my organs were really not working <laughs> at that point. And, um, and so I just cried out to the Lord, and um, God sent me help. And there was this man named Randy Coates who um, I so am grateful for, but he, God sent him. He's a missionary, and he was living 14 hours away in Nairobi, but drove out to the middle of the desert um, exploring some unreached territory with God on a little prophetic journey with God, 
and God sends him to me. And he puts me, he's like, oh my goodness, puts me in his vehicle, drives me 14 hours away to the hospital. And um, I'm so grateful. And when I got to the hospital, the doctor said, had you been two hours later, you would have been dead. I was so dehydrated at that point. And uh, I was in really bad shape. So they start working on me. And the whole time I'm in the hospital, I'm like in the nicest hospital in all of Eastern Africa. And I'm freaking out thinking, I'm dying. I'm not even worried about the fact that I'm dying. I'm thinking, I'm not going to ever be able to pay this hospital bill, you know? And um, so I'm going, okay, God, help. And so the Lord begins to really meet me in a very special way when I was there. And everything that the Lord had said to me had come true to that point. It was hard. It was so hard. I was so alone. I had never felt more alone in my entire life than to be laying in a hospital bed in Africa at Christmas, dying all by myself. Not even the Africans who I was staying with were aware that I was in the hospital. So nobody was with me. <clears throat> and um, I remember just feeling so incredibly alone. And I remember one night, it was so bad. <clears throat> and I, at this point, I, had, I was so strong. I, was, I had not cried anything. Like, I had done so well. <laughs> but I was just like, ah, I'm tired of doing well, you know. And um, I'm laying in my bed. <clears throat> and these Christmas carolers came through the hospital. And that did it, you know. I was just like, meh, I miss home. I was starting to think about my family, what they were doing, and Christmas. And I just pulled my little sheet on my hospital bed over my face, and I just cried out to the Lord. And I was like, I feel so alone. And I fell asleep. And um, while I was sleeping, I had this encounter, and it was so precious. It was one of the most precious things I've ever experienced. But while I was sleeping, I had this dream or encounter. It was so real to me. Um, I don't know how to explain it, but um, I woke up in this encounter, and I, the Lord woke me up, and he said, go and stand at your window. And there was a little window by my hospital bed. I was able to stand perfectly strong. I walked over to the bed, and what I saw was, as far as I could see, in perfect formation, perfect lines, was what looked like one million um, army men standing at attention outside the hospital. And I was like, dear God, you know, I'm freaking out. I'm like, why is like, what, what is this like the Kenyan army? Like, what is this? And I couldn't figure out why there was a million soldiers in the parking lot of the hospital. I mean, as far as you could see, standing at attention. And I was like, what is going on? And I heard the Lord speak to me and he said, you are not alone. He said, you have no idea how many angels I have dispatched to stand at attention on your behalf. You are not alone. And that was so, that did it for me. I was like, my father is so good, you know? And I, um, later actually, this is very, very sweet. Um, when I got home after all this, I found out that there's this little girl in my church. She's five, she was five, I think, at the time. Tabitha and um, her mom came up to me one day and she was like I just need to ask you what happened on this day you know on the, at this time and I'm like why and she said well Tabitha came running in our room at like four in the morning and woke us up and said mommy 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 we have to pray for Jennifer right now and they were like why what happened and she said Jesus came in my t- came into my room and told me we have to pray right now that he will send one million angels to her and so they all got up out of bed, got on, their, got on their knees by their bed, the mom and the dad and the little girl, and they prayed that Jesus would send me, she prayed that Jesus would send me one million angels. And when I look back, back, it's exactly the day that I had that encounter with the Lord. And so such sweet times um, in the midst of the suffering. But um, at one point, this is also very, very sweet. As I was laying in my hospital bed, um, the African people I was staying with had found out that I was in the hospital, so they rushed down there to, to come see me. And um, one of them comes with a prophetic word for me, and he says, the Lord spoke this to us this morning. We have to give you this word. He said, I don't know what this means. He said, but we're to tell you this. We could only get one thing every time we ask the Lord what's going on. And this is what the Lord told us to tell you. This is about spiritual promotion. Exact wording that God had used and given me a year and a half earlier, or whatever it was in my journal a year earlier. And I was just like, whoa, okay, I don't even know what that means, but I'm trusting you, Lord. And so um, 
my case pretty they, they didn't know what was wrong with me they did all the testing whatever and basically said we have no idea like basically um you have witchcraft <laughs> they didn't know <laughs> they said it's something we've never seen in our entire life it's like a new breed of tropical disease it's killing all of your organs you're probably not going to live kind of situation and they said um we need to do an immediate surgery we know that right now to take out your appendix and just kind of assess the damage and kind of last ditch effort see what we can do and something happened when they told me that it was like something clicked inside of me that was like i'm done with being a good sport no no satan you are not going to do this to me you know this is not okay and so something rose up inside of me that began to contend in a very serious way for um for my life and for health and for the will of god and so um Basically, people everywhere began to pray for me, and my family at this point was aware of what was happening, freaking out, of course. You know, everybody everywhere is just an intercession, and um, and so at that point, um, that I, I was praying. This is probably on day, I don't know how many days I'd been in the hospital at this point, but um, laying in my bed and crying out to the Lord for a miracle, and I fall asleep. And while I'm asleep, I have this experience where I saw Jesus walk into my hospital room and it was so intense and so beautiful and so full of light and so peaceful and Jesus just stood right next to me. I don't know how I knew it was Jesus. I just knew it was the Lord and he just smiled at me and he took the back of his hand and he actually cut me open all the way down vertically down my stomach and took my skin and pulled it back and it was so graphic and real to me I mean it was like watching surgery on tv it was absolutely disgusting okay and I'm like oh my gosh you know and he just said be still and he pulled my skin back and one by one he begins to massage my organs and clean out these tubes and I don't know do all this stuff to me and I'm just like you know because I mean it was so incredibly real but I had such peace and um and so as he's doing all of this I'm just thinking oh my goodness, nobody is ever going to believe that this happened to me. This is amazing, you know? And I'm like, this is like, I don't know if I'm in a drug coma, if I'm like just delirious, but this is a great dream experience, whatever this is. And um, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is even free surgery because I was freaking out about the money. And I'm thinking, this is just great. Well, at that point, he looks and he says, that's good. And he takes his hands and he closes my skin up. And he has in his hand, like my, ex I was just going, wow, like my exact skin color. It was like a putty or something, like a mud. And he starts to put it on top of the incision. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to wear a two-piece again. You know, there's no scar. And I'm like so excited about this in my dream. <laughs> it's really funny. Anyways, um, <laughs> the things we think about. So I'm like, this is awesome. Free surgery, no scar, you know. And, um. And then right then I wake up because in, in reality, my surgeon had come into the room and was messing with one of my tubes that I was hooked up to. And it woke me up. And okay, I have to just be really honest with you. When I woke up, I was in incredible pain. I did not feel one bit different. Okay, I was terrible pain. I hadn't eaten in over 10 days. I was in terrible pain. Even the smell of food would make me violently ill. I was blow like my my intestines were just swollen i mean it was absolutely terrible and um i woke up and i thought you know i have to really make a decision here like i just had this encounter yes i don't feel any different but really i have nothing to lose because i'm gonna probably die if god doesn't do something anyway so you know what god is not a god my god is not a god that would tease me so I'm just going to stand on this. I believe I'm healed. So I just start yelling, I'm healed, I'm healed. I mean, fully, okay, like fully going for it. And um, I mean, I wasn't feeling any different, mind you, okay? But I'm yelling, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. My doctor f totally thinks I've lost my mind. He's like trying to inject me with something to knock me out for surgery. I mean, they had told me, you even sneeze wrong. We're cutting you open, you know, because they wanted to have the surgery right away. And I made them like postpone it for 24 hours so God could heal me. And, um, and so... They fully think I'm crazy. And at this point, I have a whole room full of doctors and nurses looking at me like, you're crazy. And I, but every time I would say, I'm healed, it was like strength and virtue came into me. 
and I was getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And by the time my room has got all these doctors and nurses, you know, I said, oh my goodness, I'm hungry, bring me food. They could not believe it. They could not believe it. So they bring me this food and they're looking at me like, okay, prove it, you know? And I, I devoured my food. I mean, I was starving. I hadn't eaten in 10 days, you know? And I was so hungry. And I mean, I felt totally fine. They rushed me off. They're like, this is, this is not right. They rushed me off for testing. I mean, it was brutal. Eight hours of testing. And the same doctors came back with, this, with the results. Medically undefined. We have no explanation. All this poisonous bacteria in her body has, is disappearing rapidly with, without any explanation. Um, all her organs are functioning totally fine. Miracle. She's healed. And I'm just like, yeah, you know, so excited. God completely healed me and, and spared my life. And so um, at that point, a lot of things began to drop from my head into my heart in a very real way. I knew a lot. I knew God could do miracles. I knew God could take care of us. But when you're in a, a situation where you have to actually physically walk it out and test the word and see how God will work in your own life, it's a whole other thing. It's a whole new level of authority. And <clears throat> so it was like I could just feel things dropping from my head into my, into my spirit. And, um, but, you know, there was a very real threat against my life from the enemy. And so actually the day I left the hospital, um, I went and I was going to stay with his family that had found me out in the desert because I, I was supposed to still be on bed rest. And so I go stay with them for seven days. And my first night, this is Christmas Eve, my first night out of the hospital, I'm barely walking, you know, I'm still very weak. And um, I'm staying in a little guest house out in their backyard. And so I make my little way, like 11 o'clock at night, out to this little room, barely walking. And as I'm walking out, I notice the dog is growling at something. But I'm like, whatever, this is Nairobi, you know, it's a crazy city, or whatever. So I'm just totally out of it. I go out to my little room, put my little tiny padlock on the door, lay down. And then all of a sudden, I begin to hear voices, men's voices, whispering outside my window. And I'm going, that is not good. Because there's a 10-foot wall that, you know, surrounded this whole perimeter, this whole, you know, the whole property. And I'm thinking, that means men have jumped a 10-foot wall and are hiding underneath my window. What in the heck is going on, you know? And so I'm thinking, okay, I have no phone to call them. If I yelled, they couldn't hear me. They had Christmas music on inside. I was far away. I'm all by myself. I barely can even get out a, sque a squeak. You know, I was so weak. I mean, I couldn't even hardly stand. And so I was like, there's absolutely nothing I can do. And so I'm thinking, you know what? I'm staying with a white family. This is Christmas Eve. I think these guys are here to steal a few Christmas gifts and go their merry way. There's nothing I can do about telling these people. Like, I can't warn them. So, Lord, protect them. May a lot not be stolen. Amen. You know, and try to go to sleep. I mean, there was nothing I could do. And then instantly, I just heard the enemy so quickly. And he said, no. You think these men are here to steal gifts? I told you, you'll pay with your life. He said, I've sent these men to rape and kill you. And it was so real to me. And at that moment, um, and I, there was five men. At that moment, um, they start breaking in my door of my room. This, by far, was a thousand times worse than dying in a hospital. I would instantly had rather been back in that hospital than to be all alone imagining myself about to be raped and killed by five men. And um, so weak. I mean, I couldn't even have fought them off. And, um, and at that point, I was so consumed with fear, absolutely consumed with fear. And I thought I was going to actually die before they even walked in the room because I was going to have a heart attack. Between adrenaline and the drugs I was on, it was just like, nah! And I, mean, I was so paralyzed and consumed with fear. And they're, they're breaking in the door. And, um, and at that moment, the Lord spoke to me in such a profound way. And he said right into my spirit, he says, hurry up and make a decision. What's it going to be? Are you going to choose faith or fear? Hurry up. Your life depends on it. And I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. How do I even not choose fear right now? I am so cons consumed with fear. And the Lord said, what's it going to be, faith or fear? Hurry up. And I was like, God, I have no idea how you're going to get me out of this. But you know what? Fine. I choose faith. I choose to believe 
although men are inches away from raping me and killing me, that you are going to get me out of this. I choose faith. And instantly, the word of the Lord began to come back to me. All the verses the Lord had told me to memorize. You know, Psalms 27, the Lord is my light and my, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? You know, it goes on, when evil men come against, uh, come to devour me, they'll stumble and fall. All these things, all these promises the Lord had given me. And it was like life began to come inside of me. And I don't know how to explain other than it was a supernatural gift of faith. But fear completely left my body. I mean, they're inches away. Completely left my body. I was so consumed with faith. I jumped out of that bed. And actually, because I, the, the, as the word was like resonating in my spirit, such life came to me that I began to really understand who I was as his child. And it was like, they have no idea like who they're messing with. Like, I'm a child of God. Like, they are not allowed to do this, you know? I don't even know. How, it was such a gift of faith. But um, I actually was kind of funny, but was completely 100% convinced that if they stepped foot in that room, that God would strike them dead. There was no doubt in my mind. Actually, to the point where I actually felt really sorry for them. So I jumped up, and I was going to tell them, like, give them a warning, you know? You guys, please leave, because God's going to strike you dead in five seconds if you don't, you know? And um, so I jump up supernaturally with strength. I rush to the window. It's pitch black in this room. I've never been in there. It's like a little school room. And there's three at the window and two at the door. And so I'm going to tell the guys at the window, hey, you know, God's about to burn you. So, I mean, I had just seen lightning come out of heaven. I mean, I knew God was going to do it. And, uh, and so as I'm on my way to the window, this is kind of a funny story, but um, there was actually this plastic bag on the floor that I didn't see, of course, because it's dark. And I'm running to the window and I whoom, slip on this bag. And I mean, I am out on the ground. I'm like, boom, you know, hit the desk, hit the, I mean, I'm just like totally on the ground. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. <laughs> this is not how my story was supposed to end, you know. And, uh, and I could just feel God kind of just laughing, just like, you know, Jen, I'll, I'll take care of this one, you know. <laughs> I'm like, great. And so he just says, don't move, be silent, you know. I'm just laying there. Well, this is totally like a Gideon story because the, the noise was really bizarre. The plastic, the sliding, the, <coughs> you know, against the desk, the whole deal um, kind of created this interesting noise. Well, when the noise happened, I, could, I was watching, I could see the shadow of one of the guys by the window because it was so close to him. He jolted like that. When he jolted, his arm set off the motion light, which set off the dog barking. I'm going, this is good. This is good, you know. And so all of a sudden they start freaking out. And I'm hearing them go back and forth in Swahili. And I'm picking up enough, understanding enough to hear what they're, you know, get the majority of what they're saying. And they're freaking out. Is somebody coming? I don't know. Is somebody coming? I don't know. I think so. Well, hold on the light. I don't know. Da, 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 you know, wait, be quiet, be quiet. Was that, a, was that, was that a gun noise? What? I don't know. What was it? I mean, they couldn't figure out like if somebody was, they didn't know what was happening. And so they waited for a second. I'm like, God, please. And they're like, no, I think somebody's coming. So they take off, jump over the wall and gone. And I'm like, <gasps> dear God, peel myself up off the floor. And, but at that point, something really went deep into my spirit. And that was where it was like, the real transfer from my head to my heart of this is my daddy who I can trust. And I honestly, you know, whatever, I honestly believe that story would have ended differently had I not chosen faith in that moment. I believe that. I believe that we have a decision, you know, and every situation is different, but in that situation, I had a decision. And I believe that if I would have chosen fear, it would have been an open door for the enemy to come in. And, um, I believe oftentimes we're, we're presented with, with a choice if we're going to choose faith or fear, if we're going to use our spiritual eyes or our natural eyes. And sometimes we don't, see, we don't even realize the degree of the consequences by which we choose. Um, but that was a real, a real time for me where everything began to really become solid in my heart. And I was like, okay, you know what? There's nothing. There is absolutely nothing the enemy can do to me that God God can't handle. I've, I felt like I'd seen it all. I mean, I had, there was thing after thing that happened after that event, but I had no fear at that point. It was like fear was settled in my heart. It was like, I mean, I, I still get afraid sometimes, but <laughs> I mean, it was like in situations like that, I knew that I could trust the Lord. And um, so there was a real, a real turning point in my, in my heart. Um, and I think that's something that like my prayer for you guys would be 
is that you would come to a place th- through the word, not just, I mean, I had heard the word. I had so many verses in my head. It is a totally different story to get them deep in your spirit. You can sing, pray, speak, preach the word of God, but it is a totally different story to get it alive and active in your spirit where you're actually, like, you would bet your bottom dollar on it, you know, in a life or death situation or whatever. Um, and that's really where we get tested, you know. But um, my prayer is that you guys would come to a place where you would truly, truly, truly understand your identity, truly know who you are in him. Because in that place, that will give you an authority that will release power. And you have to have authority first, right? So as you come into an identity of who you truly are as royalty, as a child of God, as a kingdom child, in that place, you begin to walk in authority. And from that authority, you begin to see power. And um, that was the real process that the Lord walked me through. And so that was a time of really gaining authority. Um, And so... After all of, you know, several events like that where I nearly lost my life, um, God began to speak to me, and that's where the real call for my life came. And that's where God said, um, in a very real, simple way, but he said, I want you, because I was crying out to the Lord saying, why is the enemy so trying to kill me, you know? Like, what is going on? And um, the Lord was very clear, and he said, I want you to teach the next generation an undiluted gospel. Will you teach, equip, impart, release upon the next generation an undiluted gospel? And I'm thinking, I don't even know an undiluted gospel. Like, I've been raised in North America. Like, we don't even have an undiluted gospel, you know? Like, our gospel is like the gospel of the church. Like, I want the gospel of the kingdom, you know? And I'm like, ah! And God was like, will you trust me? Like, will you trust me to teach you? But I had such fear of God on it. It was like, I knew that I had to impart to, to children and youth um, an understanding of God. Not really. I had such fear of God. I could not put any religiousness in it. I mean, I work daily trying to keep that. I mean, it is so hard. We don't even realize how religious we are. Our lingo, our Christianese, our mindsets, our, the way we do things. I mean, we think we're free, but it's our very freedom sometimes that we think we have that's our bondage. We don't even know. And I'm going, God, I... I so want your heart, you know, and, and I, want it, I want to see this next generation really get it, really get it. I want there to be a generation who really raises up, who gets it, who really loves you, who doesn't care about building their great name, who doesn't care about, you know, they don't question you. They really know you, and they really know who they are in you. And that just began the cry of my heart. And um, at that time, I was working with a few children, orphans, street children living on the street, dirty, cute little ragamuffin babies. And, um, and God said, start with these, just a few kids, start with these. And so I had no idea what I was doing. I sat in the dirt with these kids every day and just began to try to teach them an undiluted gospel straight out of the word. That was the only guide I had. You know, I mean, now that I'm getting more into this mix, I'm meeting people who are doing really great things with kids. But at that time, I mean, I had, mm-mm. There was nothing. I mean, it was just like children's church was Bible stories and cookies, you know. I mean, this was like, how do you teach these kids an undiluted gospel? So as I began to teach these kids, the Lord began to just come in a very powerful way. And I was so convicted the whole time because, like, for example, when I would teach them, God heals the sick. I mean, these kids had, I mean, they had never heard the gospel, right? Right off the streets. It was so great. I loved it. They had no religion. It was so awesome. And I'd tell them, God heals the sick. They'd be like, whoa. You know, I'd be like, God's in you. Whoa. <laughs> so go heal the sick. You know, they'd be like, okay. And they would just go and heal the sick. Very easy. They never asked. Like God, I, everything inside of me would want to be like, oh, but sometimes not everybody's healed. And sometimes, you know, like pull all my junk into it. I mean, it, that's reality. But there's a lot of our own junk in that, you know. And I mean, it was just straight from the word. You have authority over sickness. Jesus took care of it on the cross. Go. I mean, and these kids took it seriously. They never questioned. They would go right into these hospitals or wherever, and they would heal the sick. And so it began this whole movement of, of doing this. And um, in, in the second tape series that we're going to be doing, um, we're going to be talking about 
you know, how to mentor and release the next generation. I'll be talking more into how to, how to do that. But what that began was a whole movement of, of children. And it started with just a few kids. And these few kids became 10 kids, became 50 kids, became 600 kids, became 5,000 kids who got it. And God supernaturally, sovereignly did it. Children, simple children who begin to really understand and know their creator. And they begin to walk in power and authority. And, and tr- you know, massive transformation began to take place through these kids. And so um, after that, God began to birth this vision, you know, more and more into me. And so um, my ministry, what I'm doing now is called Global Children's Movement. And that's how it was birthed, was simply sitting in the dirt with a few kids, trying to obey what God was asking me to do. And so since then, um, we've been training and equipping children in several nations, um, in Africa, North America, Central America, um, working with kids and youth, training leaders how to strategically mentor and release their kids. And my whole message, which is so interesting, that the Lord made me walk this through first, was, is to these kids, is that God still uses Davids to take out Goliaths. And we are literally seeing little orphan children take out massive Goliaths in their communities. We have kids who pray. They'll pick a law that they don't like that's unjust in their government. Pick a law. This is an unjust law. We don't like it. We're going to fast until it's changed. And they'll begin to fast and intercede, and the law will change. I mean, they're bringing massive transformation. Children taking down Goliaths. And so that, you know, I think that whole journey that the Lord walked me through was really in preparation for my message of what I was to really impart to this generation um, about the fact that we are inadequate. And the second you think that you're, you've got it figured out, you just disqualified yourself. You know? That God is looking for simple, humble, obedient people. That's it. Who can listen and obey. He's not concerned with how much you know, how, you know, how many great programs or, or Bible colleges you've been to or, or whatever. He's still looking for the simple, humble little person who says, Jesus, I have no idea what I'm doing, but I know that you're my daddy, and I know that you're big, and I know that you're strong, and I know that you can do a lot of things, and I love you, and I'm going to obey you. And choosing to step out and obey and being surrendered. And that's, that's the gospel. That's the gospel of the kingdom. That's the gospel that, of the kingdom that's going to be preached in the whole earth before his return. And so... That's been um, my focus and, and what I'm doing. Um, and since then, we've been really sovereignly seeing the Lord stir in the hearts of kids and youth and leaders. And it's very small. It's a very small beginning. But I, I really believe that there's a, a, a global awakening that's coming. Because coming. God is globally raising up children and youth and young adults in this season um, for such a time as this to be leaders, to, I mean, God, of course God is going to use the simple, of course. Why is he going to let another generation pass where, where people get credit? Don't you think God gets sick of it, you know? Of course he's going to use the, the simple and the humble. He loved, that's his specialty. The whole Bible is full of that. God loves it. And so that's why we're all perfect candidates, because we're simple, we're real. You know, you probably feel young, you probably feel like, I don't really have all the answers, and that's great. That's a great place to start. And so, um, you know, with Global Children's Movement, our vision statement, I'm going to read you our vision and mission statement because they're they're our heart and our passion of what we're doing. But our vision statement is, our vision is to see a global move that releases children and youth into their rightful place of value and influence, empowering them to rise up as vessels of transformation and revival. And our mission statement We will strategically disciple, equip, and release children and youth while inspiring and providing resources for others to do the same. And so, you know, in our team um, of us that are working with this, we've made it really simple. Like, we have some very clear values we live by. One is, you know, if you, everything you believe, I mean, just think about this for your own life. Everything you believe about God, can you communicate it to a seven-year-old? If not, something's wrong with what you believe. Because the gospel is for the simple. God has always been the God of the poor and of children. And can you communicate everything you believe to a seven-year-old? If not, learn to. Because that's who's out there. 
we'll be talking more about statistics, but over 50% of the Earth's population is under the age of 15. If you want to impact the world, you better know how to impact children. That's who's out there, right? So can you communicate what's in your heart to children and to youth? If not, maybe we need to make some changes about how we communicate. Because um, God is, is sovereignly moving on children and youth and young adults everywhere. Um, and so our team, you know, another one of our values that we're <laughs> trying desperately to live by and um, oftentimes find ourselves in these situations is we have a value that we're, we don't want to take on any project that we can do by ourselves. We choose to take on projects that our success solely relies on the massive intervention of God himself. <laughs> because, quite honestly, and I know a lot of you guys feel this way, I, I don't want to do what's been done, what can be done. I'm tired of it. Like, why do what can be done? Why do what everybody else is doing? What's the point? I don't want to reinvent another wheel. I want to I be a part of a generation. I want to be a part of a movement of the Lord that can do what can't be done, that gets out of the way so God can show up. You know, I don't want to take on projects that, I know if I work really, really hard and get a great team around me, we can do it. I don't want that. It seems so foolish, but it's the wisdom of God. You know, I want us to be at a place where we say, you know what, God, I want to take on projects where I am dust if you don't show up. And in that place, we create an opportunity for God to show up. Like, who would even think to take on a thousand-year blood covenants with Satan? Like, I mean, you don't do that stuff foolishly, okay? I'm not saying, like, go pick a thousand, you know, go pick a fight. But, I mean, listening and obeying and coming to a point where you're really willing to believe. Like, I think we need to just raise the bar of what we believe. What are you believing for? Are you believing for, you know your community? Why not believe for your nation? You know, whatever it is, like, are you believing for whatever? I mean, just raise the bar, because God is so able. And I want to be a part of a company of people who, who truly, truly, truly are willing to ask for the impossible, because I believe those are the ones with childlike faith who truly ask their daddy for totally the impossible that God is going to allow to see those things. And God is doing it. So, um, we're going to finish with this, but just, you know, in sharing this, my heart, you guys, is that you would just really hear um, why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and the faithfulness of God and how my life, I think, is just simple um, forerunning for, for so many of a generation who are going to be called to do absolutely profound. I mean, I believe you guys in this room are going to go so much farther and do so much more and see so many more exploits than I'll, than I'll ever see. And I hope it's that way. That's, that's God's heart. And so my prayer, you guys, as I've shared this, is that you would be encouraged and challenged and go, whoa, she's just a normal person and God is using her to do great things. Yeah, because that's how God is. He's good and he's faithful. And even in the midst of all those things, you can always choose faith because he is in control of our lives and he is faithful. So, Okay, so one um, last thing I forgot to say was that, um, you know how I shared about how the Lord, you know, during my testimony, how the Lord had spoken to me before I went to Africa the first time and told me um, that I was going to walk through these three years of very intense times. And after that, you know, things would change in my life. And the whole, like, topic that that came out around was when I was crying out to the Lord about wanting to be married at that season in my life. And um, when the Lord asked me to betroth myself to him for three years, um, after all these things that happened in Africa, um, now I'm, I'm in my last part of those three years, and it just so happened, and this is absolutely the Lord, because there was, there was no way we could have manipulated this. Um, I'm engaged now, and to be married, and it's totally the Lord, and, um, the only time between our crazy schedules that we could actually even have a wedding this year happens to be June 6, 2004. And it's a Sunday. It's kind of a weird, it was the only time we could do it. And it just so happens that my three-year commitment with the Lord is up at midnight of June 5th, 2004. And the very next day, we get married. It just so speaks of the faithfulness of God in my life, how he's so faithful to his word. And he's so, and I'm so much happier than I could have ever been. And it's just, it's so good. So I wanted to add that last part.